Hello, everyone. I am going to preach a message on faith today. I've entitled the message, Faith in Fearful Times. I believe this message is going to be highly appropriate for where we're at as a nation and where you may be at uh, in your own life. Uh, There's an old saying I remember learning when I was in Bible school, if you feed your faith, you will starve your doubts to death. I love that quote. Feed your faith, starve your doubts to death. You could also say, feed your faith, starve your fears to death, or feed your faith and starve your anxieties to death. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we're going to hear the Word of God. We're going to read the Word of God. I'm going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. It says, Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible passage of Scripture. Thank you that we're in a good place today to hear the Word of God, to receive the Word of God, and then to act upon the Word of God. Be with each person within the sound of my voice. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your Word today. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. So I have a question. Who talks like this? I mean, what we just read is mind-boggling. It's astounding. First of all, Jesus is hungry. He sees a fig tree. He, go, he wants to take some, get some fruit from the fig tree. Uh, he goes up to the fig tree. There are no figs. And so he literally curses the fig tree, Right? No man shall ever eat fruit from you again. And the Bible says here in Matthew's rendition that immediately the fig tree withered. Here, here's the creator of the universe, right? Jesus, according to Paul in Colossians 1, he created all things, right? This fig tree ultimately was from a fig tree that 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 was in the Garden of Eden, right? So Jesus, the creator of all things, God now in human form, right? He's hungry, he wants something to eat, walks up to the fig tree, no frigs, he curses it, and immediately it dies. The disciples had never seen anything like that in their life. You and I have never seen anything like that in our entire life. And they thought, this is incredible. And then Jesus uses this moment as an object lesson to teach his disciples the importance of faith and the power of faith. Once again, faith in fearful times. How God wants us to feed our faith and starve our doubts to death. Feed our faith and starve our fears to death. So Jesus gives them this lesson and he teaches them the importance of faith. Now, Jesus is telling all of us, if we could get to a place in our life where we can banish all fear, all anxiety, and all doubt, faith in God, faith in God's promises can be activated in our life, and through our life in such a way we would be astounded by the results that our life can produce and experience by faith. Who hasn't read their Bible? Who hasn't read the book of Hebrews? Who hasn't read the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews? How it lists all these heroes of the faith who by faith they overcame incredible circumstances and the odds that were against them. By 
faith, uh, Noah built a boat, and by faith, they passed through the Red Sea, and by faith, giants were defeated. All these men and women were ordinary men and women who did extraordinary things because of this topic of faith, believing in God and taking God at His word. I'm sure the disciples that day, after they heard, they saw what they saw and heard the words of Jesus, you know, in, in modern terminology, they may have said, uh, hashtag, Lord, please clarify what you mean, right? Uh, hashtag funny face. Like, you're kidding, right, Lord? Uh, you're, you're joking with us. You're, you're pulling our leg. You are not literally telling us that if we have enough faith, we could cause mountains to move that we could cause mountains to be shifted into the sea. And then they wait for a response, and there's no response. Because Jesus meant what he said, and he said what he meant. He wasn't speaking in uh, some allegorical terminology to try to convey some hidden spiritual truth. I mean, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as they say, right? They saw with their own eyes Jesus speak to a tree, and it immediately died and withered up. And then immediately says, if you have faith and you do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea, and it would obey. Now, it's kind of funny here in West Texas, when we talk about mountains and sea, <laughs> we have no mountains. We have no sea here in West Texas. Well, the reality is we do have mountains, right? Uh, they're inverted mountains, right? They, they're canyons. We call them, we call them, but it looks like a mountain when you're at the bottom of a canyon looking up, right? So when we talk about mountains and seas, maybe we're a little bit out of touch, right? Because we're in the flatlands of West Texas. But in reality, we do have mountains, don't we? We have mountains of debt. We have mountains of fear. We have a mountain of pestilence right now. So there are mountains, not necessarily physical mountains, but emotional and spiritual mountains that God wants removed from our lives. And sometimes we may be waiting on God, and in reality, could it be sometimes God is waiting on us to pray, to believe, to, listen carefully, activate our faith, to take initiative. See, I believe one of the most important lessons that Jesus is teaching us here in this section of Scripture is that we are to take initiative in our life. We are to exercise a, a, a phrase, a term I'm going to use, uh, that's found throughout Scripture, and it's the term spiritual authority. We are to exercise our spiritual authority, the authority that we have spiritually from God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the power of His name, spiritual authority. We have spiritual authority over demons. We have spiritual authority over evil spirits. We have spiritual authority to, according to the teachings of Scripture, not beyond the teachings of Scripture, listen very carefully, within the context of God's revealed, written Word of God and will of God for us in the Holy Bible, Spiritual authority, keys of the kingdom of heaven, is one way that they are referred to by Jesus in the Gospels. I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven to unlock the treasures of heaven, right? But this spiritual authority God's given to us to reshape our world. Some might be saying, now, Pastor Carl, do you, do you really believe you can move physical mountains? That's a, that's a fair question. Come on, Pastor Carl, based on what you just read here in the Bible, do you really believe you can move physical mountains? Let me ask you a better question than that. Do you believe the words of Jesus? So first, you answer me that question, okay? Do you believe the words of Jesus or not? Or are we going to spiritualize everything Jesus said in the Gospels because there's some metaphorical, allegorical, uh, sp hidden spiritual meaning behind them? Or did Jesus mean what he said and said what he meant? Is Jesus simply using hyperbole, right? Ex an exaggerated statement, you know, to prove some spiritual truth. Or can we take Jesus at his word literally? 
Let me show you another verse of Scripture in John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, (laughs) and watch this, right? And greater works. Say that with me. Greater works. Then these he will do because I go to my Father. So Jesus very clearly here is telling us, I'm not going to lower the bar for my disciples. I'm going to raise the bar, right? I'm like, well, we, we can't do the things that Jesus did. You know, he was God in human form. Exactly. And yet he said here, the works that I do, you shall do, and greater works, because I go unto the Father. Uh, let me ask you another question. Uh, can, can people walk on water? No, no, people can't walk on water. They, they, that's, that's an in, 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 impossible uh, endeavor. Uh, that's an impossible, insurmountable fact you cannot overcome. People do not walk on water. Except there was a guy who walked on water whose name was Peter. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Peter did hear Jesus uh, teach this to the disciples, right? Uh, prior to being spoken here in John 14, 12, works I do, you'll do in greater works. So when he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if it really is you, bid me come to you. And Peter stepped out of the boat and he began to walk on water. Yeah, I know we like to focus on the fact that he he sunk, but before he started to sink, he did. For a moment, for a period of time, he did something no human being's ever done before. His faith in Christ's word allowed him to walk on water. Why can't you have some water walking moments? I'm not saying literally walk on water, but some moments that you perform feats for the glory of God beyond your physical capabilities because of this thing called faith. The works I do, you shall do. So back to the words of Jesus, though. He's saying that God has given you the right to determine and help shape your environment. You can change your situations in life. You can alter your current reality. I I know that sounds like far-fetched pie in the sky, but not so fast. Not so fast. Once again, in verse 21, so Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, that's the key. If you have faith and you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also... If you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will be done. So once again, in verse 21, (laughs) Jesus said, what are you saying to your mountains in life? Oh, how big you are, mountain. How foreboding you are, mountain. Oh, mountain, right? Oh, you're, you're too big to go around through or under, oh, mountain. The prophet of God in the Old Testament said, Who art thou, O mountain? <laughs> right? You shall become a plain with shouts of, of praise and glory. You shall become a, a plain with shouts of grace, grace. Yeah, mountains. Mountains can be moved in our lives. So with incredible boldness, the Lord himself declares, Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. But those are the words of Jesus. Take them or leave them, right? Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Well, if I ask for a Ferrari, will God give me a Ferrari? Well, do you really need one? Is that what you're asking God for, right? I mean, 1 John 5 says if we ask anything according to His will, okay? So you you do have to put it within context, right? If you ask, ask anything according to His will, it shall be done for you, John tells us in 1 John chapter 5. So let me give you a biblical definition of the word faith, because the word faith must be dynamic, because faith is a, it's, it's a verb. It's not, it, it's something that we do. It's action. So faith is more than knowing that God is something. Faith is knowing that God does something, right? A lot of people have faith knowing 
that God is something, right? That's good. That's a start. But faith is knowing that God does something. God does something. God is still doing things in the earth today. God is still hearing and answering prayer. God can still heal sick bodies. God can still perform miracles. Well, I prayed and nothing happened. Well, did you pray in faith? I did. Well, then just keep on praying. (laughs) Ask, keep on asking. Seek, keep on seeking. Knock, keep on knocking. The door shall be open. Now, back to this statement, this definition of faith. God is something versus God does something. Whole denominations, maybe you grew up in a denomination like this. Whole denominations, they know that God is something. And that's the start. We know He is glorious, is holy, He's omniscient, He's omnipotent. We know this. But there are whole denominations, they know God is something, but there are whole denominations that do no longer, they no longer believe that God does something. That God does something. Mark chapter 6, Jesus was in his own hometown and he wanted to heal people, but they uh, were familiar with him. They had no faith. And it says there in Mark 6, 5, in his own hometown, he could do, he could do no mighty works except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them because of their unbelief. What? Yeah, read it for yourself, Mark 6, 5. He could not do any mighty works. Didn't say he wouldn't. Now he's God. He could do whatever he wants, but he's not going to violate human will. Said he, he couldn't because of their unbelief. Think about all the things. Faith is not complicated. Faith is not hard. Th- think of all the things that uh, we kind of take on faith today, right? Uh, by faith, right? You, you jump in your car, and by faith, you believe it's going to start. Uh, by faith, you jump on an airplane uh, to fly somewhere, and you believe that that airplane is actually going to get you there, right? You take by faith that the pilot has a pilot's license, right? Uh, this is kind of unfair, right? When you fly, they require you to produ- produce uh, and proof of identification. Well, why can't we have proof of identification that the pilot is actually the pilot that has a license, right? We simply walk on, sit down, and just take it by faith that the pilot is a pilot. In other words, there's a lot of things that we take by faith, right? Uh, you know, you, you take by faith, you're not going to get sick if you go to the grocery store and you don't have a face mask uh, anymore. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't have a, a mask or you don't wear gloves, right? We take a lot of things by, by faith today. And yet, when it comes to believing God and taking God at His word, sometimes we question God. We doubt God. Sometimes it's it's simply that our faith is too small, right? Could it be that our faith is too small? That's a fair question. And Jesus answered that in Matthew 17, verse 20. Jesus answered, said, because your faith is too small. I tell you the truth, if your faith is as big as a mustard seed, which is one of the smallest seeds, by the way, you can say to this mountain, move, here, here he goes again, right? Uh, move from here to there, and it will move. All things will be possible for you. I'm not making this up. This is Jesus, the ultimate authority, talking. And he says, what prevents these mountain-moving moments in our life is because of our faith being, he said it, too small. But no matter how small you may think your faith is, if it's as small as a mustard seed, that's enough. That's a start. But if you want to have mountain-moving faith, we got to have a disciplined spirit. You see, people that move mountains, they, you can't just say whatever you want. You, know, you can't just say whatever comes to mind. Right? Some people say, well, I, I just wanted to give them a piece of my mind. Yes, and you've given so many people through the years a piece of your mind until you have no mind left. <laughs> right? So it's not just saying whatever you know, is on the top of your head you got to be disciplined in your spirit. Look at Proverbs 18, 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. James 3, James has a lot to say about the tongue and how the tongue is set on fire by hell itself, which sets our own world on hell, right? 
by the words that we speak. There's an old German proverb that says, to curse is to pray to the devil. <laughs> that's, that's a good one, right? To, to, to curse, to cuss, is to pray to the devil. Now, have you noticed, uh, maybe hopefully we haven't, but profanity is the new norm. It's the new fashionable method of, of really stressing a point, driving a point home. Vulgarity, profanity. Comedians are using it. Entertainers are using it. Sports figures are using it. I mean, the use of profanity, it doesn't reveal how strong a person is, but rather how weak they really are, right? If you can't prove a point without using profanity. You know, there was even a time the Apostle Peter used profanity. In Mark chapter 14, verse 71, it says, but he started cursing and swearing, I don't know the man you speak of. So even good people can get caught up in misusing their tongue, right? Not having a disciplined tongue. Profanity displays more ignorance than it does inventiveness, John Blanchard said. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Let no foul or polluting language, or, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech that is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others, as it is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace. God's favor to those who hear it. The power of words, right? Words that can move mountains or words that can create mountains. The society is known by the language it uses. We see the coarsening of the American soul by the debasing of our language here in our country. John 6.33, Jesus said, the the, the Spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. Then he goes on to say, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Words have a spiritual dimension. And because words have a spiritual dimension, listen, they can produce life or death. You know, Jesus used his words sparingly. Matter of fact, in front of King Herod, during his trial, I just read this in my devotional reading two days ago, Leading up to his crucifixion, he remained silent. He didn't use a single word. You see, words have a spiritual nature to them. A word can go deep into a person's heart, their spirit, and never leave them. Some of you, some bad words, some almost curses, have been spoken over you from the time you were a small child. You're so dumb. Why are you so dumb? You're so ugly. You're just words. You know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Wrong. You can heal from sticks and stones, right? Broken bones can heal, but broken hearts and wounded spirits at times without God's love and grace can never heal on their own without God's love, without God's grace. 2 Corinthians 4.13, the Apostle Paul said, And since we have the spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. We are to speak the things we believe. And there is what's referred to as a spirit of faith. A spirit of faith that can be spoken based when we speak what we believe. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let me give you three takeaways in the close of this message. Three takeaways. Once again, Matthew 21, 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Three things. Ask, believe, and you will receive. Now we can go to the PowerPoints. The first one is ask. In James chapter 4, the second part of verse 2, James says, you don't have because you don't ask. What is it that you're believing God for? What's the breakthrough that you need relationally, spiritually, financially, health, emotional? What's the need? Ask God and be specific. Most don't ask be because they wonder how. How will God do this? Faith doesn't ask how. Faith asks and then believes and trusts that God knows how and God knows when. The second thing is we have to believe. 
You have to believe. That's what Jesus said. Ask, believe, receive. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said to them, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes, to he who believes. It's not believing because of the circumstances. It's believing God in spite of the circumstances. The Bible says about Abraham, against all hope in hope, he still believed in God's promise to him. You know, when you make an order at Amazon, right, if you order something on Amazon, you place the order and then you wait for it to arrive. And you don't keep replacing the order until it arrives. You already place the order and you wait patiently for it to arrive. When we pray according to God's will, we believe we will receive. And then we have to wait and trust for God's delivery. And finally, number three, James 1, 6, and 7 says that we have to ask, ask in faith, nothing wavering, for a double-minded man shall not receive anything from the Lord. So we have to ask, we have to believe, so that we might receive. You see, you don't receive and then you believe. Anybody can do that. There's no faith in that. You ask, you believe, you trust, you have faith, and then you will receive. The believing comes before the receiving. Simple lesson on faith that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples, and he's wanting to teach you today. I hope you will dig deeper in God's word concerning this topic of faith, that God will allow you to have faith in fearful times. If you're listening to me and you don't have a relationship with God yet, you can through his son, Jesus Christ. You simply need to open up your heart. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. A simple prayer, something like, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner I need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if, you'll con- if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raise him from the dead, you will be saved. You can simply ask Jesus to come into your heart right now. Say, Lord Jesus, that's it. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I turn from sin. I turn to you. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Amen. It's something as simple and yet as glorious and profound as that. And God comes and he meets you where you're at. If you prayed that prayer, or you'd like more information about what it means to follow Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, contact the church. You can call us during normal business hours, 806-792-3363. Or you can jump online, trinitytoday.com. You can download the Trinity app. We're here for you. We love you. We believe in you. Until next time, God bless.